Slavic program and since I can almost remember it myself, probably got my first computer at the age like 11, 12. I'm uh, pretty old, I got all like gray hair. And so my age, 11, many, many, many years ago. Um, Spectrum, probably none of the people here are gonna know what it is. Anyway, it's just, never mind. Well, not a real computer, but it's like something you could program. So that's where I started, um, learning a lot. And a Mac computer back in 1984. Uh, that was middle school. Nobody else had a Mac. I was pretty much collaborating with myself. Now it's kind of hit at the time. It was, it was very rare. But probably the real, the first real station is I, I got like a, a real programming job at the age of the end of the ninth grade. Um, of course, it's all like family, right? So I have a cousin of a cousin of a cousin was looking for somebody to employ a cheap price, so I got their job. But my daughter is in heaven now, and I told her that like a few months ago, and she's like, that isn't this pretty strange? You should be people to start with babysitting. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, maybe it's strange, but this is kind of how I got into the uh, job market. And, and there. So what were you programming? What was your first job in, in that field? Yeah, that one was pretty much shut. I mean, nowadays they would allow it. Child slavery, the guy would pretty much pay people like a minimum wage and expect them to write something. It was not successful because it's like a conversion funnel, right? You employ like 50 kids, one of them puts up good software, and then you sell it. I was one of the 49. Um, but later on, I, I kind of started doing some freelance work, and that actually, uh, still in high school, I kind of created this software, Mac software, that allowed people to, you've seen like Adobe bought Figma a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. one of the last week, whatever. So another company Adobe bought was something called Freehand. Some of you may have heard of it. It used to be the, like the best like software people really liked here. That's what started the Mac here in Israel. But it only worked in English, like left to right. That was in the 80s. So I was the one writing the thing that allowed it to work right to left. Hebrew and everything else. So they sold the software for about $300 and then they sold my add-on for another $300 because you couldn't use the original stuff. And probably the funnest anecdote if you're all software, this is like one tip for you. The software was very slim. It was just like, it was literally changing the original software to work right to left. It was like 4K or something. Like so small. And I was like doing it with a partner and he was like, you cannot sell 4K software for like 300 bucks. So we put like this large image for so the <laughs> Anyway, tip for you, always a larger uh, liver, but if you ever have a software. So it's good that you can charge more for it. Yeah, it, it goes by the weight. Like, you're not going to buy one pound of, I don't know, this rice for 100 bucks. You want to fill in for the rest. So basically, you started your uh, programming, you, you know, you work in this industry at a very young age, and then you joined the army, you studied, and I guess. I then, yeah. I then joined a company called Magic Software Enterprises. It still exists yeah. today. It was actually pretty successful. Asia. Yeah, they're yeah. in Asia, right. Now the kids are like uh, somewhere in this neighborhood, I think, Itoro. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, um, it, it was actually interesting because it, it was the first, I think, software company, what Israeli software company that went public in Nasdaq. Very successful. 100% market share in Israel, 50% market share in Japan, 0% anywhere else. They have like corporate markets. <laughs> <laughs> no product management at the time, so they kind of developed whatever they thought, but brilliant entrepreneur, successful company at the time, they reached like I don't know, 20 million dollars of revenue, which at the time was like big. Um, so I learned a lot there. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of went to finish my master's degree, and then I got pulled from my master's degree by some by a company called the Zappa Digital Arts, or Gizmos, some of you may have heard of it. They were building 3D worlds back in 1996. Mm. Like Second Life, some of you may have heard about Second Life. Unculus, no, I'm joking, but. So like 3D worlds, and, and, and the internet was just starting. I literally remember flying to the US uh, for that company and buying this book, Internet for Dummies. So like, how do you connect? Like, okay, put this, this, put the number, AOL, whatever the thing was. And I immediately realized that's gonna be a thing. Now it's obvious, and it wasn't obvious at the time. And I was like, how is this gonna work out? So somebody sold me the idea that the internet's gonna be 3D. People are not gonna work with text and images of 3D. So I joined this company with avatars and words. It was interesting, but completely useless. Um, so when I finished this, finished my master's degree and then started my previous company. So that's kind of my road to, uh, to starting companies. And your, your first company was uh, Web Collage. Tell us about the, the story, how did it come to life, what happened with this company? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting story because um, did all of you hear about ICQ? Yeah. So it was one of the most famous like startups in Israel because they kind of, a bunch of kids, started this thing about messaging, sold it after a couple of few years with like, I don't know, at the time a lot of money, still a lot of money, like 300 million or something for messaging app, essentially. Completely like blew every, everybody uh, uh, on his mind. And they were sitting next to me in Zappa, I guess So, um, like, it meant it no, in no uh, bad way, because it's gonna sound a little bit bad, but like everybody saw this like four young kids going and selling a company, selling it for 300 million dollars, 
There's probably like 50 companies that emanated out of this small startup called Zaba, because it's like, oh, these kids can do it, I can do it as well. Mm -hmm. So I think I was one of those folks who kind of started a company subsequently. Uh, partner with somebody, had this idea of something that, you know, I, I'm still looking for it. Something where if you visit websites, you can kind of store them somewhere collaboratively and then like, I don't have a memory. So like you can find them later. Like I saw this website like, three months ago, can I search for it? I still can, but anyway, we went looking for money. People told us it was a horrible idea, but they thought we were nice. I was young at the time, like less than 30. They were like, I'm like, okay, so what am I gonna do? It's like, I'm nice, good, thank you, appreciate it. My wife speaks the same way, but it doesn't, doesn't need any more. So eventually they ended up investing in a, in a, in a, in a mode called Free Seed, which basically they gave us half a million dollars where to go find a different idea. It's kind of strange, right? Like, why are you guys gonna do this? And they basically said it's less risk. That sounds strange. I said, why is it less risk? They're like, well, if we invest in you and you have an idea, we have no idea if the idea is good or not. But if we invest <laughs> the money, then we together kind of think about an idea. You know, you go kind of search for it. At least we got more guarantee that okay, we get more firsthand look at what you're doing. So did this, recorded the third partner, kind of CEO in New York, started a company, moved to New York, spent a few years there, including 9 11, the infamous wow. collapse of the towers, and then came back in 2003. But it was, it was a nice ride. It's only 2013 after many, many years. And it's interesting because you said um, that the reason you found the startup because the ICQ guys were next to you and like, if they did it, I can do it. And I always get to, uh, many times I get to talk or ask about the fact that um, in Israel they say that about 96% of startups fail. So when I always find, try to understand what is the reason for this 4% to pursue this? And you're saying it's because they did it, so of course I can do it. I mean, was that, I guess it wasn't your only reason, but it seems like it was a big incentive for you. Look, I, like at the time, I didn't think that was the reason, right? At the time, I had this great idea. We're yeah. going to be successful. We're going to conquer the world. We're going to make tons of oh, shit, lots of money. I was there, right? <laughs> and of course, there's no limits because you're young. You don't see any number if you just probably be in this category. Um, but, but you know, in reality, I don't know if it was a bad idea or an OK idea. We, of course, weren't able to execute it. We were very amateur at the time. Even the third person we brought to the CEO was still like amateur at the time. You know, now he's obviously much more uh, experienced. Um, but we gave it a shot. I think in hindsight, probably like it seemed easy because other people have done it. Uh, I'm sure that if I hadn't seen, I think part of the Israeli ecosystem, you are all here and some others are like, we've seen so many successes, that everybody's like, well, I can do it, or I know it's yeah. doable. If you go to, I don't know, Switzerland, somebody wakes up in the middle of Geneva and like, I'm going to start a startup, and they're like, what is, how do I even start? Yeah. Is it doable? So the ecosystem here is really nice in terms of the uh, foundational support that it gives you, the belief that this mm -hmm. can be done. Whether it can or can't, it's a story. <laughs> it's a good support system. Because um, so, uh, when you actually you actually worked with big um, with big brands, right? With big American brands. You know, if you can share a few, name a few. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, uh, Webcolage yeah. was the, the start from it. It's kind of funny, you know, how old uh, I am. It started with a software company that we actually installed and, and people's like stuff. I, I literally flew to American Express, gave data center in Phoenix with like airport control. You know, kind of they take you through security, install software, then we moved to what's called application service provider, which meant we took the software home to it for them, and then eventually it became SaaS, which means one thing, well, uh, call it uh, uh, multi-tenant SaaS, which is like basically we hosted one system for everybody, and that was many years later. And the software was basically allowing brands, manufacturers, to push product information real time to retailer sites. So customers would be any people like Microsoft, Sony, Procter & Gamble, the Colgate, the Gillette of the world, Chanel, Almost everybody who manufactures uh, products, and instead of sending CDs or files or whatever to, uh, to uh, Walmart or Amazon or Best Buy, uh, we do kind of real-time stuff where Best Buy could dynamically import all of the product information customized for them into the website, so it would be fresh, up-to-date, seamless, and so on. It was a really nice, everybody liked it. I mean, we raised like $70 million. That was in 20, I don't know, before 2010, so at the time, it was lots of money. Um, also, people liked it. I think Procter & Gamble paid us half a million dollars, IBM two million dollars, Microsoft more than a million dollars. Except that in hindsight, there just are not as many manufacturers as you might think. If you just look, how many, like, just go through your head, how many manufacturers are there in the world that you care about, right? Mm -hmm. You don't care about the people who sell on AliExpress, right? You care about the big brands. So like TV, you know, there's like, I don't know, Samsung, Sony, Toshiba, the seven, right? It's like, okay, uh, what else? Uh, I don't know, refrigerators, like seven. You know, and then so like, I kind of the other ones, right? Five. So you multiply this, you probably get to a few thousand manufacturers worldwide. So 
Some of them don't care about product information, some don't have product information, some don't sell online. You kind of start trimming it through a funnel, you get like, we had a few hundred paying customers, and it was very hard to get to thousands, so the company <coughs> just just kind of, kind of became flat, and it was a good time to sell. And then you sold it to answer.com? We sold it to answers, it wasn't a great sale. We raised, I think, 60, 70, we sold it for about half of that. So <laughs> not a huge outcome. I mean, we gave the investors some of the money back, but um, it was better than nothing. Uh, after 30 years, it's not a huge investment. But it's still, you know, obviously it seems like you have um, innovated, disrupted this, this industry back then with, uh, with Web Palacia solution, which you did, you've, you've done uh, with Gong as well. But you, you mentioned um, one thing right now, but I would like to know what was your key learnings from, from the experience in Web Palacia that you were able to bring to Gong? I mean, you just mentioned make sure that the market size is big enough, for example. What else maybe fits for me as, as a manager, as a um, entrepreneur, or any other tips that you can share that like you brought to Gong? Yeah, um, I think at Web Collage, in hindsight, we probably made every single mistake that can be made, and then a few more. Mm -hmm. um, so I can share many learnings, but I think maybe top three, just like maybe later if you want to ask questions, I'm happy to tell you about uh, what wasn't working, but um, the market was not big enough. So here's one lesson for all of you starting a company. It's like always, the investors are always going to be like, oh, so what's your attempt? Go to the different market, market size, right? And you're going to be like, boom, 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 gazillions of dollars, right? And we could make the numbers work, but the reality was it wasn't a big market. So now when you go sell, even if you reach, I think we reached at 15 million dollars of sales, or maybe 20, I don't remember. So it wasn't like horrible, but it's just like at some stage when you don't grow, the company is not worth much because every, everything is about growth. So be realistic about what is the market size. I think we didn't, well, we stuck with the technology a little bit longer. I mean, we had a few opportunities. It was like, oh, this is not what we want to do, and I think we should have done. If, if, if you have not read Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, you probably should. One of the things he's basically advising startups is focus on the small market, build it well, and then extend to adjacent market, like a frog thing. And we got this first two customers was Estee Lauder and Chanel and, uh, Cosmetics. And we're like, no, there's no point in chasing this market, it's too small, which it is. But in hindsight, we probably should have grabbed all of the L'Oreal's of the world and sort of established one base. And the next customer was Cisco and American Express, and everybody, everybody was different. And then we couldn't scale it even at that stage. So I think focusing, uh, kind of picking key customers and working around them was probably key. And then I think we probably made every single better hire possible in, in, in the business. So I think that's experience. Uh, but hiring is very, very important. Maybe that's three. There's many more mistakes, so I'm happy to go. Uh, mm -hmm. We won't have enough time for all of these. Thank so, so you you founded the company, you sold the, you sold the company. You're now, you know, you have the value of I guess the entrepreneurship and Gong came to life. So, how was the, the idea for Gong uh, inception and what were your how did you start it? Yeah, the idea was not mine. It's not like the uh, piece. How do you say it? Like hitchhiker. Hitchhiker. Uh, I'm a hitchhiker here, so. Um, a good idea? Let's go. Yeah, let's, let's do it. So <laughs> the, the thing is, as we sold like uh, Web Collage, and then I stayed with the company for another year just to sort of like be nice to the acquirer and the team, I didn't want to leave them like with a new buyer and like figure it out. So after a year, I took a sabbatical, which is one more key learning. I recommend to everybody you can take a sabbatical, it's always great. Did a lot of things that are unrelated to tech, started the school, um, <laughs> took a few university courses, I will, you name it, right? And then, uh, but also looking for ideas. So I partner with a bunch of people throughout the way. I mean, I was like, there's a coffee place, I live in Car Milano, there's a place called Juno, and I probably spend there every morning. Like they would give me my coffee without me asking. So I uh, met a bunch of folks who were like in my situation, in different forms, and we were like, hey, do we have ideas? Do we have something to work on, blah, blah, blah. So I think worked on a couple of ideas with a couple of people. None of them materialized. In hindsight, were very bad ideas. Um, maybe not very bad, bad ideas. And then I, will, I just gave up. I was just like bored to death. I was starting to climb on walls. There's still like probably signs of my walls and just like climbing them. Um, so I was talking to a few people about joining them as like um, uh, companies, like as an exec or whatever. And then um, I got connected with Amit, who's my current partner. And he was just leading Sisense. He was the CEO of the company called Sisense. And he came out, he's like, oh, I got this idea. At Sisense, we had a bad quarter. Sales weren't working, we didn't know why. We realized then that if we listened to calls, we would understand what's wrong. But I'm not going to listen to thousands of calls, it's the way to automate. 
So luckily, part of my sabbatical, I took a deep learning course in, in Florida University. So I'm like, yeah, speech to text is becoming better, and it will become better. Optimistic in general, let's build something. And that's how it all started. But it really stemmed from him having a pain and the knowledge of where the general direction should be. And then uh, kind of, he, dropped on, he took on like sales marketing, I took on product and engineering, and we kind of started it. Now, you know, not every company gets to work on uh, this, which is obviously amazing for your unfortunate brother. Um, but I'm sure there were different struggles along the way, if it's personally, if it's professionally. So if you can share a few stories maybe of some, let's say, uh, triumphs that you had to overcome uh, personally and professionally to be able to you know, grow this company. So, um Cobb was like, no, it's, gonna, it's gonna sound bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it over there. So, uh, Cobb wasn't too hard. Uh, in the sense, we, we kind of got lucky. Like, uh, most of the stuff we did initially was working. Partially, by the way, is if they sort of like every. There, there is a Shia Gnon story about this woman who's got a few words, like uh, the Eli, I think it's called. Yeah. She's got a, 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 like a, a cap of the number of words she can, she can speak in her lifetime. So, when she finishes this, she's dead. Same with me, mistakes. So I've done all of the mistakes in Web Codex, so we just didn't have room for more mistakes in, in Gong. So we just couldn't make many because I, I kind of ran out of quota. Um, so I think at the end of the day, we didn't have so many uh, issues. I think initially it was hard to raise money, believe it or not. It's like right now, it's like, oh, the company's worth, you know, how, however many billion dollars, and how, how did people miss it? But it was hard to raise money. If any of you has a hard time raising money, doesn't mean you're an idiot. Could be that you have partly whatever. Um, well, it wasn't easy raising money, so Gong is capturing conversations that people have, recording calls, emails, and so on. And people were like, well, sales people are not going to be wanting to be recorded, and there's too many sales tools, or CRM is going to do it. So many reasons not to do stuff. There's always reasons not to do stuff, right? It was hard to raise money. But when we started, customers really liked it. So I think from that point on, there's always problems, right? We lost a customer, key customer. Adobe actually was like, are we going to go with the competitor for a third of the price? The competitor was horrible, but then inside the inside, he was losing. losing. And especially if you don't lose on merit, it's just like, this is not even a fight, right? They're like, they got a person inside. So you always lose deal, you lose people. Some people are, you get hired. Some people, you get recruited. And you're like, shit, I really need this person. And I don't think there's anything strategic. It was like, oh, we went up to this market. We have to deal with I think we're kind of marching in, in, in the steady direction. Seven years now, so we we'll see how the economy. Maybe now there's going to be, uh, I don't know, the uh, the macro economy might hit us. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, but you say that overall the, the product obviously was uh, was um, accepted very well. You again disrupted, you innovated this market. Um, I want to know. I mean, you in your experience, you have done. You carried diverse responsibility responsibilities. I wrote a few. So you did the inception of the company, technology, engineering product management, management, marketing, general management, would you recommend founders to get such diverse experience um, as you did? You didn't say Panelli. How do you say Panelli? Panelli? Uh, you like cleaning the addition. Uh, did you? Uh, the tiles, yeah. The cleaning tiles. the tiles of the thing, making yeah. coffee. So when we had the first finance person, I mean, a real story, we had the first finance person join Gong, and she came to me, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, this is the founder, and I'd be like, okay. So she came to me, I think a little bit concerned and you know, fearful. I don't want to say fearful, but like, and she was like, you know, do you mind if from now on I, I would take on the thing about ordering coffee when you offer? I'm like, okay, you can take it. So I did everything. Like, ordering coffee was also part of, part of my role. Um, but uh, look, like, I don't think people should be doing stuff they have no idea about, right? So I, don't, I didn't do marketing, I didn't do sales. Um, I'm not, yeah, I, 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 I know how to work with accounts, but I'm not like a sales person. So I, like, that's why I respond to usually partners. Um, I have engineering training. I consider myself, uh, had considered myself a reasonable programmer. Um, I, uh, um, you know, I have a professional product, so I kind of these are the things I took on. And so I, we kind of started there. And now there's a different R&D manager who's, I think, better at running large organizations, which I'm not too good at. I think I still do product okay. If not, they'll fire me and find somebody else, but that's fine as well. Um, so yes, I think everybody should focus on, on what they are good at and find other people who compliment them. And in terms of competition, you know, I, I just Googled it and I found different articles that say, the article goes like this, top 10 gong alternatives and competitors. It's always 
Gong and the world. And I remember I was working with a startup in the also sales sector, and I was sent to different conferences in the U.S. And I saw all this booth of, uh, of Choros and Outreach and all different companies in the same space. And what was your strategy to penetrate the U.S. market? How did you overcome competition? Share, show me the strategy, the challenges. Yeah. Um, there is probably several aspects. Let's take it one by one. The first one is focus on having raving fans. We call it raving fans. This is a, it's not a common term we use all the time. Just focus, focus on customers being successful. That's actually a thing I heard from a person by the name of Marco Burge, who was the Chief Revenue Officer at HubSpot. I called him before we started going. He was like, hey, what do you think? Um, and, and I think when you have customers that really, really like the, pro the product, that propels a lot of things. So if you don't have this here, screw so Right I'm sorry, was that through um, design partners or? Yeah, the first the first customers, we can't depend people who like the network, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the key is make them happy, right? So once customers are happy, it's a good start. So I think that's that was always the focus. Make sure customers are happy, they like us, talk to them, what's needed, what's missing, how do we make people more happy? So I think that's sort of the crux. This is like without it, you can't do it. And then I think we sort of, you work different areas. One is you build a little bit of brand, Gong has done a good job there, but I think it also stems from having a good product. So now we have people who can say it's a good product, so now we can market, blah, blah, blah. I'm not responsible for marketing. I talk a little bit about brand, brand creation, but it's a whole part of itself. Um, I think that's one part. So our strategy was a differentiate, just like we had this weird logo, it was like, honestly, oh, we have like a funky look, mm -hmm. and then I think partially just differentiate. Uh, so that's one part. Um, we did a lot of content marketing, which is like, hey, here's an article that tells you what sales people should be doing. And people were subscribing to this just to get information. And that kind of got us a little bit more um, in the market. And a lot of like hard work. We took somebody, a consultant in the US, calling his network, bringing the first set of accounts, repeat, 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 repeat. Eventually, it boils down to having customers who can tell the name, tell the story, and having a product that they like is sort of the engine of you know how you grow and grow and grow this. If you don't have the right product, not gonna work. If you don't have customers who can actually advocate for you, not gonna work. So that at least in the B2B space, that's the key. I, I have no idea about B2C. So if any of you is in B2C, not listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> and did you take um, salespeople from the US or you were uh, the salespeople at the beginning? So the first salesperson was I mean, my partner, the CEO. He was a decent salesperson, I think. Did a good job, got us the first few customers. Who was your first customer, if you remember? I don't like the first design partner. I don't think they were the first paying customers. And, um, a company by the name of Acton, out of California. They're like a Marketo wannabe. Um, Sisense was one, Israeli. Um, so that's one, basically. Um, so uh, Amit was the first salesperson. And then we took a consultant out of the US, somebody we knew. Um, we tried to have SDRs. SDRs are people who call and make appointments. We tried to have them in Israel. It wasn't a success because tough hours, can't scale it, blah, blah, blah. So we had a few of them, we have to move, we have to move everything to the US. Um, so at large, at this stage, we still do not have a single salesperson or customer success service person or SDR or marketing in Israel. One marketing was that Israeli marketing, but that's pretty much it. Because my next question uh, is actually about one of my favorite. It's about the cultural differences. So I wonder if at the beginning you had some chutzpah moment or if you have any tips in general that you would recommend entrepreneurs to avoid when dealing with American or European culture. Oh, and these are two different cultures, so. Um, <laughs> oh, American, for the, for the, matter, <laughs> the American culture. Yeah. Um, so, so, like I don't think we as Israelis should try to be American. So that is my previous company. I was like very high dressed up and anymore as you can see. Um, but um, there is a cultural gap and I think at Gong what we did was try to codify uh, how we work. We call it operating principles. Some people call it values, a name I hate. Um, but it's basically saying how do we work as a company. And the way we've done it is we had all of the people like take, write what do you like about Gong, put it on a wall and cluster it together. So we have like eight operating principles. The one that people in the US like most um, is something we call no sugar, which basically means say the way it is, non-sugar-coated. <laughs> and it's funny because that's a very Israeli thing. It's like, you know, fuck you, this is right, wrong. 
but uh, uh, people in the US still appreciated directness. Now, the level of intensity of the data of stuff is not something they're used to, but I think we, we kind of try to find the middle ground. And yes, when somebody, like I remember our head of sales came into Israel 2017 and 18, and we were having an Israeli debate. You know, Israeli debate is like, not everybody talking at the same time. And he was like, and he was like um, trying to say something. And we didn't even notice. So at some point, like, 45 minutes later, he was like banging his head, I want to say something. And every, all of us were like clapping. Thank you, JD, you have sort of finally uh, became Israeli. The, the anecdote here is first of all, he got it, and then like, he, no, six months ago, he had a meeting with a bunch of Israelis. And he was like, no, we should do this, don't do it that way, that's wrong. And people in Israel were like, oh, this guy is, is aggressive. And we're like, oh, good, Israeli is this person. And I, I kind of called him afterwards, like, hey, dude, you just like <laughs> completely converted. So I think there is a way to bridge the gap. You don't want to be overly like sugar coated, you got to find some middle ground. And I think also US and Ireland is different. US is very politically correct. Europe, like we have offices in Ireland, they're like, don't give a shit. They're like, I send them a core of jokes, and at least they pretend they like them so much. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, okay, so we talked about Gong, how it started, your first sale, you're in the market. Tell us about this scale. What, was, what did you do at the scale? How did you systematize it to become Gong.io? And yeah. you know it. So scale, I think, it touches every piece of the company very, very differently. So I think, uh, in Israel, we're about 300 people, uh, we're 1,200 of them, so it's a big company, um, scary. Um, so in Israel, it's, it's just um, product and R&D, and the, the thing is, the system that we use is to sort of, almost like build multiple different startups. So we use a concept called pod, which I think is pretty common now, but we started fairly, which basically says take a product manager and, 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 and a designer, and a bunch of engineers, put them together, call it even a problem to solve. Build a new iPhone, I don't know, whatever it is. And less than 10 people. You know, Jeff Bezos always says, uh, if you have a team that you can't feed with pizzas, it's too big. Um, so, uh, same idea. And then I think right now we have 25 of them, so I think, or 30, I don't know how many. So. But it's okay, so this person, this team really works on sales, on, on something called insights. They don't give a shit about the rest of the company. The key is how to make them autonomous, not put blockades in their way and make it them work. So I think this is product and R&D. I think it's sales, it's much more of an operational aspect, sales and customer success is hiring right. Do you use Gong inside Gong? We use Gong. We live in Gong, um, of course. Um, I, I don't think we live in where we are without Gong, um, but it's all about you know, hiring the right managers and, and repeat. Sales is a lot like a, a machine. It's like an enablement team that kind of teaches every new person how to kind of, what's the cycle look like, what's the pitch, and then it's got the ops team, which basically kind of makes sure that the process is supported and the system supported. And then you sort of throw more stuff at the top of the funnel. Hopefully something gets out of the bottom of the funnel. If you, boost, if you put three more salespeople, they should produce X amount of revenue within three, six months. If they don't, you stop hiring, you fix what needs to be fixed, and you restart the uh, stuff. So as long as the market is infinite, you can always put more salespeople. Remember, from web the market was small, we couldn't do it. In Gong, we still don't know what the overall market is, but we're not saturated. Uh, but at some stage, you become saturated. Every company becomes saturated, even Microsoft. So it's like, at some stage, how do you kind of find your product, your directions, or something that gives, gives you an excuse to hire the more people. And with that in mind, what to expect in the next uh, five years for Gong? Again, I mean, you, you have gone through the COVID. Obviously, COVID was, was good for you because so many companies, if they, I guess, weren't into uh, such a type of sale, they had to go through that. So, and the world is evolving, digital transformation is you know, obviously more and more out there. How do you see the future? Yeah, so first of all, COVID was eventually good for us. First quarter, we had like a worst quarter, quarter ever, right? So it was, that's about hard moments, like shit, we're not selling, uh, which is fine. I mean, like a quarter later, everything was back, but it was like a shit moment, like we stopped hiring, we think about firing people, we, we did not, but like, these are all things, you know, like it could get worse, right? Nobody had an idea, right? You, you all probably remember that, right? Um, eventually, it got back to uh, normal and then accelerated. The, um, I, I think for us, it's, we started with what we call conversation intelligence, which is understanding conversations. Then we moved, I think, wrong right now, people would see there's something called revenue intelligence, which is understanding how your own revenue organizations work. And that gradually transforms into a, a set platform or suite that is basically the place where salespeople, revenue people live. Like, okay, what do I need to do next? Gong's gonna tell me. Um, how do I call? Click on Gong. 
you know, how do I know what to say wrong, uh, whatever, how do I forecast my, my, my number wrong. So we have some of the pieces, we're building the rest of the pieces, but our fundamental belief is two, three, four years from now, um, there's gonna be one system um, that people are gonna use. If, if you kinda know this, this sort of the revenue domain, people thought CRM was gonna be displaced. Everybody uses CRM. CRM ended up being a database where people don't wanna put data into, and everybody I think now understands that there is a new system, whether it's gonna be global or not. We're not gonna be the only ones. I hope we're gonna be the best ones, I hope we're gonna be the most successful one, but it's the jury's still out, we're still fighting for that. Um, so that's the two, three year vision. I think as I mentioned before, eventually there is um, a limit to every company. So I'll give you an example. I think there's about 10 million salespeople in the world right now. Uh, I think that's all part of the number. You could argue if they're 15, eight, what does the salesperson mean, et cetera. Com has about 200,000 paying seats, fewer than maybe even more. Um, so we have kind of where to grow. Okay. No worries in the next couple of years. But at some stage you get to two million, it's like, iPhone doesn't have 100% of the market. You know, Google does, it's a monopoly, but maybe even Google is probably 90%, right? So you're gonna saturate at some stage. So what we're looking right now is to understand, you know, are there additional applications? Like, very, very few people work in this in Google. Like, what's the next, what's Act B for Google? Oh, maybe we can do this for uh, recruiting. Maybe we can do this for, I don't know, for lawyers. Maybe we can do this, I mean, there was one uh, Apple school, about three, about three, when uh, we announced we can have Google for dating. So no. that's probably not, uh, <laughs> but the uh, you know business stuff we can still uh, make big other things and you know we should, you know, we're gonna figure out I mean, we are working with design partners to understand what makes sense. So you can check in April Fool's Day. You can you know you can test your te your, your test exactly. on that day. If the crowd loves it, then maybe it's a it's a good direction. Look, if one not. of the things <laughs> favorite stat and comp spits out is something called talk ratio, which means if you're a salesperson, you should not be talking more than pick your number to sixty percent. Mm -hmm. Because most things people love to hear themselves, oh, let me demo it to you. Mm -hmm. 30 yeah. minutes later, the customer is gone to the bathroom, came back, and they're talking. <laughs> and you cannot imagine how many people are like, oh, I so need this to talk with my spouse to kind of measure our talk ratio. So, yes, maybe there's application mm -hmm. to that. Okay. But you know, because you mentioned that, do you have any, any specific tips for yeah, for sure. founders who are selling, now you're working to sell the product? So you're saying make sure your conversation are not too long, for example, anything else that may come to mind? in terms of things that you discovered through Well, I, I, I think selling-wise is, is mostly, I think everybody's gonna, like, there's, first of all, try to understand the customer's problem as much as you can, especially in early stages, like, what problem are you solving? Right? Everybody loves their own product. What problem are you solving? And then tell, explain to the customer what is it that you're solving. They don't care about features, they don't care about technology, they care about the stated problem that they have. So if I can't get from here to, I don't know, uh, the next building, because it's too slow or it's raining, then I might need an umbrella. If you send me an umbrella and I don't care about spring, then you probably just wasted your time. So I think it's all about understanding what, what are you solving for. It's very hard, but it's something that um, first, first I think kind of lets them work. And which one of you, if you can raise your hand if you're entrepreneurs, if you have a company or about to start a company? Okay, good. So I guess uh, you and others uh, at some point are going to fundraise. And you, you talked a bit about that, and I would love to know more about uh, your tips about fundraising. Especially early stages, but any tips on fundraising? So fundraising is not is fundraising is not easy, right? I told you most people did not want to invest in com. Uh, I still keep some of those emails. You don't think this is gonna work, you don't think it's fun. Like you send it to them once. Oh, oh I love this one. <laughs> and good, really, really good investors. Like don't get me wrong, like one of the few of the best investors in Israel. It's like, oh this is not gonna work. Or you know the thing is that they never say no. It's like, oh talk to us in the next round. There's no no. Uh, so, um, tips, I think first of all, make sure there's a real market. I mean, not sell investors to this market. You're gonna spend time on this, so. I spent 13 years in the web product. I probably should have done it like after five years, realistically speaking. So like, is there a real market, enough opportunity? Because if it's like, you're selling your groceries to the uh, neighborhood, this is not a VC type thing. Uh, so that's maybe number one. Number two, don't waste all of your time fundraising. Just continue running your business. Continue selling, developing. I mean, it's like dating, right? I haven't done it for many, many years. Uh, but it's like there's some you want to. You don't want to show too interested. So you want to like continue doing what you're doing. Like join me whenever you, you can. But I'm going to continue selling and doing business, and and kind of not have your money. But 
not waiting for your kind of thing. So this is the dance, or this is the uh, um, the um, stand you want to take. So when we started raising money, I think it was like, I will tell you what the right strategy is. I'm like, yeah, well, tell me this. You know. uh, and he's like, what you got to do when you raise money is sit at home, and every VC that calls you, tell them that you're not interested. <laughs> Like, dude, I don't think you're like the typical entrepreneur. It's like, oh, if anything, right? It doesn't work for everybody. Uh, but so, I mean, don't go that far. Because I mean, it was pretty like known in the industry, so he was, kind of, he was he was able to do that. But for most people, it's still playing the balance of like, you know, just continue doing work, making progress, and at some stages, you're going to enjoy the ride. Um, so, and make sure there's a good market, and of course, a good team. Mm -hmm. And hustle, hustle. Now, um, I would love to know more about what, um, who supported you or what information do you consume? So if it was any mentors that supported you at the beginning or today, what kind of books, magazines, podcasts uh, you're, you're interested in? Wow, a good question. Um, I don't do too many podcasts. I mean, I do with my kids. Chuba, but this is something different. <laughs> um, with my kids, we do uh, uh, lots of stuff. Even, uh, how many kids do you have? I got two kids. I coerced them to listen to Yuval Noah Halal, you know, to oh, the other thing. This is so deep, and they're like, you know, they're kids, they're teenagers, and they can afford to do it. Like, so, we're such geeks. Like, I love it. So, uh, so that's, <laughs> I, I don't listen to any podcasts myself. Our office used to be in Erslia, and it was, again, I don't have time to read it in podcasts. I kind of prefer to kind of scan, shadow, shadow person. Um, but what I really like to do, and I actually have a post, uh, sort of like a post, if you ever want to Google it somewhere, um, the person, like I write posts and somebody else like actually writes them. I just like he calls me. It's like what do you think? I'm like blah blah blah. I'm going to write them. And so my, the marketing team gave me this writer. I guess he does a good job. And, and, and I want to say I call it, but I think he called it the spiral method, which is basically when I want to learn something, I would pick the person who knows something about it. Like when we started learning about speech to text, they know shit about the speech to text. So I found somebody who heard the name from somebody. Like okay, what do you know? It's like blah blah blah. And the next question I asked is, who, who else do you know who knows something about it? He gave me two other names, and I'm like, blah, and I kind of chase. I probably spoke with 50 people along the way. And in the beginning, you don't even know what they're talking about. Accuracy, what does accuracy mean? How do you measure it, et cetera? Eventually, you get to a point where you have meetings where like, I didn't get anything from this meeting. So once you start getting closer, the learnings become smaller and smaller. Um, so uh, I usually do this. I kind of try to pick people. And by the time I, I'm not learning anything new, I probably exhausted this thing, and if I don't know enough by then, it's probably me. I'm not going to know more at this stage. I don't know. And was there anyone who influenced you the most, or supported you for your on your entrepreneurial journey? I tried to learn from everybody. No, I, like no, I don't think so. I mean, it's just like everybody. I hope I, I learned from most people along the way. So, you know, the founder of Magic, who I told you about, was. Brilliant person, learned from him how to design products, and you know, I meet my partner is a brilliant go to market person, all free to something from him, etc. etc. But not a very specific person. Maybe I should say my wife. Say your wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hello. It's she might be spying on me on YouTube, so yes, yeah. my, my, this is it. Perfect. <laughs> She's actually an entrepreneur right now. I think ah. I keep teasing her because I, I'm telling her, I, you know, you kind of. If you're seeing me, you probably think it's easy, right? It's not easy. It's not easy for her, but it's like, don't get, this is not how the way it normally works. I got lucky. But, and then also, I don't, like, work super hard. Sorry if it sounds like I spend a weekend with my family. I don't, I, if I work late, that means I'm probably taking 5 to 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. with my kids, and then I kind of do phone calls and stuff. So I work hard, but not, like, ridiculously hard. I, I don't take calls on Fridays, like, these kind of things. Uh, so it makes it look a little bit easy, but I think most people are a little bit less, maybe old, uh, to just like realize things don't run away as fast as we Thank you so much, Elon. And now I would like to learn from you guys, hear from you. Any questions to Elon? Yes, your name and your question. So my name is Lin. Um, maybe you can elaborate a bit about the process working initially with design partners. I mean. You know what kind of problem you want to solve, but there's a gap between the problem and the solution you want to provide. So, like, how, how did these first meetings look like? So just make sure everybody heard him. So Lee says, if you could elaborate more on the design partner, how did it work? And yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So design partners, we actually still do it all the time right now. Like every single product we develop is doing design partners. We don't develop stuff on our own. Um, I, I think I'm trying to sort of like rewind for seven years. I think the key is find somebody who cares about the problem you're trying to solve. Um, and it's like, okay, do you care about this problem? Interview them to understand the pain. Once you start having some sense of the solution, you come back, like, okay, this is what I'm thinking about. What do you think? I think the earlier you can get into a point where it's like, okay, go check it out, uh, the better, because people have all of those, like, I call them hypothetical ideas. Like, oh, if you had this, I would do this. Like, yeah, right. I, yeah, if I had more time, I, I would job more. Probably not, uh, but I would, I'd probably claim I would. Um, trying to start a diet for a while, so like it doesn't work. Um, so I think one of the things we did very well, but yeah, mean pressure me to this. So it's like, hey, you got nothing to do anyway, why don't you write some code? I go, okay, whatever. Because uh, again, initially we didn't have anything, right? Um, so we created this very, very thin prototype. I did it at home, my Gmail account, how many dollars on Amazon for credit or something. Um, and then we gave this Akron company, which I mentioned before, it's like, go check it out. And at the time, what the thing did, it, it was connecting to a comp company. Do you know what WebEx is? Who oh, raise a hand, who knows what WebEx is? Oh, lots of people. But it's the Zoom of the previous <laughs> decade, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's kind of funny if you see, if you ever think about innovation in the high tech space, look what happens. Remember this name if you ever become part of a company that is not innovating. This is what you get a bit of. Third of the crowd is going to know who you are. And WebEx used to be a Zoom. Everybody knew what it was. So uh, we only connected to Zoom, and I had. Literally, like I, I had a machine at Amazon that could record a call at a time, because it was one machine. It would hook up to a video of the web call, record a 2 p.m. call, finish at 3 p.m. If another call was starting at 3 p.m., it would start, but if it started like 2.59, it couldn't join because it was a single machine. So on average, it'd be like two or three calls a day, and it would transcribe them through cloud service, crappy cloud service, and it would let Acton people listen to them, comment, and understand what's going on. Even that, at the time, was valuable to them, just like think about it, three calls a day, four calls a day, times, I don't know, 20 days of the month. So in a repository, they could start question stuff. Um, so this was a way for them to say, hey, it's interesting. We, oh, could the system also help us do search? Or could it tell us like how much people are talking? All of those questions came up in the context of live usage, very shallow live usage, very little data, very crappy system. It was an SLA of 99% because if I would log in, I'd have to take the machine down. Uh, but it got a lot of people. It's always like, in Hebrew it's called the Lachtolema guy, I have no idea how to say it in English, but go find the Hebrew and the French. Thank you very much. Yes, your name? Uh, uh, I have a question. I'm not a go customer, but I... Can you move to the next speaker? Yes. testimony, <laughs> <laughs> they said it's a great product, but it's very expensive. So my question is, how do you price a product correctly? What, what's the process there? So Renan asked about pricing of product. I oh, missed the part when you said it's not a good customer. But you will. <laughs> <laughs> you said we're going to the right? We're going to He's asking for this guy. Leave your details, Renan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I, I don't think there is an answer to what is the right to price. I think there is a sense of what is the company, you know, first of all, like, price cannot be higher than the value that people obtain, right? So if you sell, I don't know, a uh, car service for a thousand bucks and it's not worth, you know, you don't have, like, it's not worth a thousand bucks to get, like, plenty of people are gonna buy it. So that's the offer limit. Um, I, I think for Gong, 99.99% of the customers are gonna say it provides the value. So they're paying whatever the number is. There's no question about value, which is, by the way, not trivial because my previous company, we had customers where it was hard to even be convinced that there is value, right? It's like, we like it, but is it like value, but et cetera. That's one cap. I think the other thing is, what are the alternatives, right? Um, so if I, you know, if, you, if there's only one car in the world and it costs $100,000, maybe people will still buy it, right? But if there's others for $30,000, then people are gonna be like, well, then that's good enough. So I think the, the, the sort of the, the challenge is always how do you price in a way that first of all, it has to provide a value, and then vis-a-vis -vis competition, it still provides a, a meaningful um, incremental value in our case, or the other way around, like wherever you are. Gong has decided that we are, since we are the best solution, consider the best solution by pretty much everybody, uh, we are, you know, priced premium, um, realizing there are gonna be some people who buy it for cost, 
and not going to be gone customers. Um, it's also, if you read Carsley, the chasm, it's also an issue because the, the market leader is always going to be the most expensive and also going to make the most money. So if you look like iPhone versus UI, UI is going to be cheaper. There might even sell as many units as Apple does, but because of the low price, it's going to be a third of the price and zero of the profit because you can make money on foreign stores. So I think we decided to be sort of a, not a Chanel, but like a you know high kind of high quality uh, premium uh, uh, product. Um, we might at some stage create a gong light for maybe startups or whatnot. This is something undecided yet. Um, I, I might say that we had a competitor that got acquired and their strategy was, in my mind, flawed. Um, I think one of the things that helped us, they were priced, this company called Porus, and they priced the product, it still is priced for like a half or a third of the price. What's that? They're 60, you guys are 130. Yeah, whatever, less than, less than half the price. If you call them and ask for a discount, you'll get lower. <laughs> um, no, it was, it was he, you know, the market would say it's in the fear of fraud, they look anywhere, right? And I think their sales people, I think they're just like, their sales people went to the market and said, you know, guess what we have? We're better and cheaper. Um, we got better transcription, better AI, better user interface, and we're half the price. And people were like, no, 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 we don't get it. This is compute, right? Like you can buy a Fiat, it's better and cheaper. So, so I think that hurt them really, really bad because uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't come across as credit. Well, if you were better, why didn't you sell it for 20% more? So, I think there's also a statement in how you price uh, and perception. It's gotta work, right? But if you misprice vis-a-vis your message and expectations and reality, you, you can, it's worse than, than, than another thing. So it does take thought process around. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I do have the person contact information. Was this the question? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so my question, again, Lee. So um, I wanted to ask about uh, the way that you made the balance when you spoke with these, when you initially worked with these design partners, how you made the balance between your vision and how you want to solve the problem and their questions and what they wanted you to solve them. Like one of them is more visionary and the second one is more opportunistic one. So how, how did you manage to find the balance? Uh, working with the design partners at the early stage is an art is something that you're really, as you said, there's many people. First of all, you have to understand who the person is. And when I, I have this like a one hour tutorial, I give it internally in talk, it's like, how do you discover it? The first question you want to ask is the who. Like, who are you speaking with? Do they have power? Are they smart? Are they visionaries? Because that's going to give you perspective. It's like you ask a random person in the streets, like, what do you think about inflation? They're going to give you an answer that you don't care about. If you ask the, uh, I don't know, some, you know, economics professor, they're going to give it to you, right? And so, um, so yes, you have to send the who, and then it's a balance, right? If they ask you for stuff you know you're never gonna get to in five years, you're always gonna try to figure out what is the thing, what is the main problem, what are they solving for, it's always the key question. And then just anything you're gonna provide to be able to solve it. So people are always, always gonna have pain that's product don't solve, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I would have to have one more hour in the day. I mean, if you can, any of you entrepreneurs can build that for me, I would pay for it dearly. Uh, but uh, it's, right now it's pretty hard. Um, so it's all, always, also always mapping the problem space into a reasonable solution space. We have this challenge today, so like all of our customers, like I had an offsite of our executive team in Israel last week, and basically the head of uh, revenue was like, you have no idea what customers really want. Like, okay, tell me. Like, they would love to have super insights. Like, what do you mean by insights? Like, well, if the system could tell them what they should be doing on calls, just like listen to calls, them having to do nothing, just insight, autonomously, they would pay an arm and a leg for it. So, like, yeah, I would like this as well. And <laughs> also extend on my marriage and kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's like, yeah, what people want is always gonna be up by the sky. What you can do is somewhere here and you have to find a middle ground all the time. You have to stick with reality because if you're trying to solve a problem, it's not solvable, and you're gonna be spending cycles and cycles of stuff that eventually people are gonna buy, but not use, and they're not gonna be happy. So something, there always has to be something that actually works and Yes, your name? Amnon. Uh, what would you say is easier for first-time founder? Uh, doing a great discovery and innovating for something completely new or taking a, a problem that exists in the world and just winning on go-to-market? 
And I just say that we have, I think, three alums today. One on stage and two more. Uh, two, two different ones. Who's the other one? The alum that I, uh, the other one that I was, uh, yeah. Oh, oh my God. I remember. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, uh, anyway, so I, I just told the, uh, yeah. these two before that I have a person in my team in Gong. I can name this child alum. Yeah, like, dude, like, what's happening here? And, and, and the thing is, I told him, you know, I'm going to get a raise, not a shekel. <laughs> and and you know, after a week, after coming back, it took like a 30 minutes, like a couple of days, and he came back and he was sitting at like a lunch table, and at some stage he basically raised his hand. He's like, well, everybody here can only have five jobs with me. That's it, that's the quota. Because everybody was picking it. It's like, you know, yeah, go call your name, your child, after the founder name. Did you meet the child? Look, there were jokes, we're going to buy you diapers with the name alone. You cannot imagine how, how many like, jokes were, you know, sort of... But I think it actually relates to Elon's question, because is it, do you create, like, he kind of created a need which wasn't really there. So, you, you, your question was, do I create, like, a solution for, like, a new solution, or do I pick on uh, existing solutions? Look, I'm, I'm, I don't know, first of all, there's been... I think most successful companies innovate in some way or form. So I think just saying, hey, we're going to do a uh, mixed panel. Picking on this guy, so. Um, so yeah, finally, like, waking up. Sure. So we're just going to do mixed panels. It's going to be the same product. We're going to out-execute them. No, no. I don't no. think it's going to work, right? No, no, not exactly the same. But the problem that already exists, for example, like. Even that. It's like, yeah. it's like even if you come say, we're going to do analytics better than mixed panel. Maybe, but then you're going to have to have the excuse, like, why did this mix panel really uh, miss stuff? Why are they not? So, like, it, it, there has to be a reason why uh, an incumbent, an existing vendor, misses stuff if you want to solve the, the, the problem uh, better than they do. Not to say it's not possible, actually, in their case, you know, like, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that they might be good here, but kind of came behind and kind of took, took a big leap forward. But it's one of the very rare cases where somebody came in late, late second and was really able to, uh, to sort of leapfrog other people, um, it's usually very, very hard. I mean, we came in after COVID, but not all of us were like little babies at the time. I think if somebody came in with like, let's solve the problem that Gong solves better. Oh, but you really hard. knew, but taking like, uh, for example, uh, all the ERP or uh, sales for like existing solution and making like uh, a small startup that solves uh, the Look, very, very old technologies, you're going to tweak the regulation. So if something is like 20 years old, you can say, hey, let's rethink what happened, that's what's happened to CRM space. Like people said, hey, we're going to replace seabed in the, the on-premises and, and build it in the cloud. But again, usually there's some technical thing that, that's happening. I'll give you an example, right? So there used to be a thing called Mariota Custom Taxes, Custom Taxes, mm -hmm. right? So get in Israel came in and said, hey, we're going to outthink them. But what, came, what was new was the app, right? The fact that you can actually order using an app. We didn't have iPhones or smartphones. I mean, they could open another taxi stand, but it wouldn't be a differentiating. So usually there's some angle to say, why are the previous people failing? It could be something very fundamental, like, oh, it's too heavy, it's, it's on premises, it's blah, blah, blah. But I think I would recommend to most people to be realistic about what is the thing that's driving this. I'll give you an example from the wrong world. In the early stages of thought, till now, we're like, um, there is a shift in the world from on-premises selling, to physical selling, to digital selling, not just because of COVID, COVID accelerated this, but even before COVID, there was a big shift, right? People found out that, you know, flying and taking a hotel and jumping and driving just for now one hour meeting is not as effective as having a WebEx or a Zoom meeting. So we're like, okay, so this trend is happening. Even if COVID were not around, we'd be like, well, maybe 30% and 40 and 50 and 60 and 70% of the people are gonna do this. So this, in a way, allows us to sort of say, hey, what other people are doing, call it CRM, whatever, is going to be less relevant. Because in the past, you had to type in information to CRM because you were in a meeting and you had to type it in. Now it's automatically, call it instrumented, recorded. Now you can rethink this. But there's, there's, usually there has to be some market shift, technology shift, user behavior shift, something that drives a change that makes the other people obsolete. I usually, somebody quoted me, I didn't remember I said this. It's like, Half of the companies on Earth are dead, but they just don't know it. Um, which I think is in many ways true, but it's like, what makes them dead? It's hard, really, really hard. So is BMW dead? I don't know. Is autonomous car going to replace them? Or, so it's, like, a, it's a, like, fundamentally, what is the thing that's changing? And then if you sort of find this out, you can, you can kind of 
kick people's butt. But if it's the same thing, you're gonna mix fund, you're gonna instrument a website, you're gonna put analytics, you're gonna have reports, you're gonna have the conversion funnels, I think it's it's very, very important. Right? And, and sorry for picking We had Greg, right? Yes. Yes. I'm just curious what your thoughts are feeling for the high tech industry in general seems to be or more directly contracting, you know, with the layoffs and budget cuts. What are your feelings on whether you know we're all entrepreneurs or we're to be entrepreneurs? Where it's going, where the high tech industry is going, and, and it does seem to be a tough time for the high tech industry here in Israel. So Greg's asking with everything <laughs> with the, yeah, uh, everything that happened in the high tech right now, where, where is it going? With layoffs and uncertainties and so on. Yeah, good question. Uh, in, in all honesty, I think it was just like mm -hmm. you know, the, the tech industry was ridiculously dated. So I think it contracted to its normal, to a norm, to a normal form. Um, so when I look at companies, I think they get like reasonable valuations now. Maybe uh, they probably undervalued a little bit. Some some of them are undervalued. Uh, I actually think a year and a half ago, people were crazy. It's like this company just started hundred million dollar valuation. Where did this come from? So I think conceptually, correct. Like I've been through the you know, all this. I've been through the 2001, 2009 kind of thing. So up and down, this is normal. I think right now is a hard time. It's hard to raise money. It's actually a hard time to sell, right? If, um, it's, it's hard for Gong, we're, we're a brand, but it's like, if I were to start Gong right now, it would have been not fun. Not fun because people are like, we don't have budget. I was corresponding with a Gong customer, we have a new product, really cheap, very good uh, adult product. And he was like, we don't have any budget. And well, I didn't even ask him for money, I'm not selling, but just like, it was interesting discussion. So it's hard. Uh, but the good news is, oftentimes, after hard times, many good companies emanate. It's like Airbnb emanated after the 2009 bubble burst and other stuff. So it's hard, but it doesn't mean it's always waves. It's going to change. Not always. Strategically, I wouldn't be too concerned. You've been there. You've been to a few of those. Yeah, I had like 30 percent yeah. a couple of times in my life. Unfortunately, it's not fun. I didn't enjoy it. Um, life. And yeah, your name. Salesforce, the CRM started selling, people were like, we're not gonna use anything in the cloud. And even right now, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we're not gonna do anything in the cloud. So there's always gonna be limitations, like what is, like who are earlier adapters, who are later adapters, what are the challenges, how do you overcome them? So I think a, a natural challenge for Gong is we are based, we kind of have let the organization manage the revenue based on what we call reality, which basically means we need access to reality. We wanna read your email, we wanna listen to the conversation, we know one of your meetings. If you don't want to give us access to your reality, you're not going to get a lot of value from Gong. Yeah. It's not a zero. It's not from zero to one. The more access we have, the more we can help you do your job better. Now, from day one, back 2015, we knew one of the challenges was going to be salespeople are not going to want to be recorded. Does any of you want to be recorded? Exactly. Like fuck no, right? <laughs> oh, I don't. Mind. Yeah. Most of people actually give. It's like I, I don't know the audience here. It's like I think I saw like the survey. Basically, uh, said that people under 30 in the United, United States, over 80% have been sexting with their partners. 
you know what sexting is? So I'm over 50, I barely knew what it was when I read it. <laughs> Basically, it means sending in, you know, sort of call it inappropriately, you know, photo of yourself to, to a, a, a second party. Um, I, used to, I, yeah, I used to say spouse, and then one of the ladies in the office said, why just limit it to a spouse? <laughs> uh, so, so uh, you know, I, like, I'm done, I'm done. Look, I'm, I'm close with it. But when I was, like, at that age, if I wanted to kind of call it sex my wife, I'd probably have to invite, like, a photographer take a photo, take the film, take it to a store, get it printed, put it in an envelope, stamp, send it three weeks later, we'll get it. So I did not do this at the time, but life has changed a little bit. So I think if you look at like normal life, like younger people are kind of more used to be exposed, not just from that perspective, but in general. So yes, we knew that it's gonna be harder for, for older people. There's two things in this, like one is gonna be a joke, one is gonna be realistic. The joke is all people die faster. Um, so I think just, you know, it's, it's an age thing, right? Some people are going to adapt technology faster, and eventually people also adapt. My parents use smartphones, right? It took them more than it took me, and, you know, my kids obviously kind of the younger age. So that's one, that's the joke. The real thing is that we put a lot of things in the product that in most cases, obviously your company not, but in most cases, helps reps, sales reps, get a lot of value for themselves. So it was really a thought process. This is the main objection. It still is the main objection. But most companies, when they buy GOM, there is a lot for the rep themselves. Oh, it's infinite memory. I can look at my calls. I can share them with customers. I can think, I can tag their product manager. They're going to help me. We built like 50 features that eventually the reps are going to be like, I hate the fact that I'm being recorded, and I get so much value out of it that it takes the objection away. After a few times, you no longer realize you're even being recorded. But it does take um, an adaption curve. Our customer success team, this is people with implementation companies, SaaS companies, usually work with customers to make it possible, but there are gonna be cases where the salespeople are like, we don't need, we're the best already. Maybe they are the best, they don't need any help. So, I mean, jokes aside, it doesn't always work. I think that's a great point for, for products that are in this realm of, okay, if you know that you're selling to the manager but the users are the employees, then how could you add features that would benefit them, that they would enjoy using, and then, as you said, the, the, the challenge will dissolve in a way. 100%, 100%, the product yeah. should be built in a way to help overcome the objections that people have in yeah. buying it. Again, if it's a business software, consumer, I have no idea. Uh, one question, when are you going to public? Tomorrow, I think you hear the uh, press. <laughs> are you going to ask me, uh, can you talk about it? Well, right now, I don't think companies are going to pub go public anyway. I don't think we have any concrete plans. But like, going public is not like an end thing. It's, you know, it happens to me, you're, you're public, so it's like, does it, does it like make a difference for you? I don't know. It's not a huge priority for, for I think, many of the companies. Well, uh, the Dog King PR office is a PR that takes care of them, so I'm sure they'll do a great job once it's, uh, once it's out there. So uh, you, can, you can approach them. Certainly not in the, in the <laughs> I mean, Right now, no companies are going to publish regardless of where they are. So it's not even going to publish. All right, yes, Reen. Yes, my name is Reen. And I assume you witnessed a lot of entrepreneurs throughout your experience and their journey from vision to companies. My question is, in today's world for young entrepreneurs, where, where do you think we should strengthen our focus? And where do you think we are might be uh, maybe spending our time and energy? So young entrepreneurs, where should they strengthen the focus and where the time is just wasted, in your view? Yeah, um, I actually have one tip for you. Um, no, uh, so seriously, I think spending time Look, again, I'm, 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 I'm mostly thinking B2B. So if any of you is B2C, like you could translate it, but it, I, I can't do it on the fly because again, I don't know anything about consumers. Um, I'm a bad consumer myself. Um, for, for business customers, spending time with customers, understanding discovery, understanding what are you solving for initially, and then mapping, making sure your solution solved it really, really well. We track metrics such as NPS, which is net promoter score, which is how likely we're going to recommend go. Customer satisfaction, there's tons of metrics, usage metrics. So what, depending on the stage, right? What do you measure? But you don't have to measure. Like, you look somebody, like, a good example we had was a company, a cheap Israeli company was like, um, uh, initially, you want to buy one of the first few companies. So they turned Gong off. A day later, we got a call from the CEO. The company's like, what the fuck is my company told you to turn it off? I can't live without it. <laughs> so this is a good thing. It's like, this is, this is, yeah, we got it. We nailed it. That was the thing, right? And, or people were complaining all the time. Why wasn't my call recorded? Like, what the fuck are you caring about? 90% of your calls get recorded. You can coach on them to, it's like, no, you don't get it. We get used to everything recorded. This is what I used to share, blah, blah, blah. It's like, 
Complaining is a good thing. So focusing on the impact and the value of this is one thing. Where I see the problem is wasting time is all sorts of like relationship, network building, conferences. Like why do you want to go to a conference other than meet customers? If you want to meet customers, fine. But like, oh good, I got a poster there, so people are going to see who. Like, what's the end game? The end game is build the product is successful. What that before is, is finding the right product or product market fit before that meeting the right customers. My focus is 90% of my time there. Not even invested. Like, you gotta have invested at some stage, but you know, make make schmutzy. It's like it's fun because like, oh, I went home and met five people. Like great. But you meet just one and use the other time for to build the product. And last question, Marina, you want to ask? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hi. So. Um, Well, asked, you say, if I found a startup, should I start focusing on Israel, which is rather a small market, or start with a bigger market? Yeah. So I changed my mind a little bit over the last five to ten years. I think if you asked me five, ten years ago, I would tell you, do not sell in Israel at all. <laughs> um, first, for Israelis are like crazy. Um, they're cheap, they're smart, over smart, like uh, in my, my grand. Father used to come. He came from Eastern Europe, so he would call it Eagle Hoka. You know, over sophisticated. Uh, so like, they always tell you how to do your job. And, like, it's not easy selling to Israelis. Right? So, uh, like, and then they don't necessarily present the market. So I think customers in the United States behave differently from many aspects of people. In Israel. So I think that one is like, well, first of all, you're going to deal with problems that don't exist. Then you're going to have you don't understand the real value. Then you're going to be uh, uh, people don't like to spend money here. And then eventually you're going to be swayed to other directions. So that was five, ten years ago. I think the market in Israel is now much more mature. So if you look at companies such as Gong or Monday or Audio Codes or others, they behave more and more and more like real companies or US-based companies or I mean, call it public companies, whatever the thing is, much more the same. So I think if you ask me now, I'd say try not to sell in Israel, but you have a few customers in Israel, that's not too bad. <laughs> so a little bit in Israel, but like you still have to feel the real market. Usually, the US, like it's the biggest GDP. Uh, if you don't have US customers, I'm seeing tons of companies successful in Israel. They go to the US, they're like, oh shit, I gotta rethink even my product and let them on my go to market. So, diversify, the minimum diversify. So, we had a part of our 12 initial dozen customers, design partners. Maybe we had four Israeli companies, so that's kind of okay ish. Um, maybe half, I don't remember. But all of them were like techs, global, like sciences kind of people. Okay ish. Um, but if all 12 were Israelis, I'm afraid I'm afraid of. But you did mention about the fact that like, we, have a, we have a big, a, a, a few uh, good, strong companies here, like again, the unicorns or, or the top ones. So these are companies that you, you could try and, and work with because they're more international in their uh, way of work. And, uh, yeah, you could try with more international, but there's still the Israeli buyer is not fun yeah. to deal with. Um, so if you said, of course, if you said to go in the US, it's the same as the Company. You can't take out Israel. Yeah, yeah, it's like they're always going to be nickel and dime. Like, oh, we can find something cheaper, blah, blah, blah. There's something in our mentality that's kind of, I think, yeah. like, I, I, yeah, I spent a few years in the States, and from my perspective, when I buy stuff, it's like I want to pay a lot. Not that I want to pay, but like, saving, buying for half the price and getting half the value is like, why, like, if this is worth 100 and I'm paying 50, I would rather pay 100 and get 200. Like, get me the good stuff that's actually going to make impact versus the same price. I'm still going to negotiate, but like, I want to make sure there's a win-win. That mentality is not completely made into Israel. So people will be like, oh, can I get for 200? I can get this for 200. And then they don't have getting, getting the value, which I don't think is a good, it's, impo yeah. it's not important to establishing the core product market fit. Those discussions are not useful in that regard. Sales people are going to deal with it later, but initially you want to deal with customers who actually want to buy software or whatever you're selling and do it in a way that kind of makes sense. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you so much, Elon, for sharing with us your insights and your amazing journey with us.
And honestly, thank you because you, you did change the world with what you did and you're helping so many companies to excel, especially in such uh, uncertain times. So uh, keep it up and we hope to see you again in Startup Grind where you're going to have more and more stories to share with them. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> so that